Okay. Harish? Harish? Oh, no. Thank you, Maya. All right. Well, a very warm welcome to you uh, joining for our, from wherever you are in the world um, on behalf of uh, the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford and the Synergia Foundation in Bangalore. Um, to the panel, we've called the global race for COVID vaccines. So the world has been waiting um, since January of this year when global politics and economics has been disrupted really as never before, um, as the collective might of the scientific community raced to deliver what had never really been done before, which is develop a vaccine for the novel coronavirus in an absolutely record time. It's, uh, that prize is, um, was, as the Financial Times said this week, um, perhaps the world's most coveted goal. Um, to invent a, a vaccine um, against a virus that was only identified 10 months ago, um, as we're beginning to know is now possible, is really an extraordinary uh, scientific achievement. Um, just in the last few weeks, we've, we've heard about uh, rays of hope that have emerged as a result of now, um, as of today, three different sets of clinical trials, um, revealing really surprisingly effective results. So it's, there seems to be very good reason to think that in a mere matter of months, vaccinations will begin. But it may be tempting to think that the, uh, the tasks that, that lie ahead pale in comparison. Um, and that's very much not the case. Um, the manufacturing of vaccines at scale, the distribution of the vaccine in an ethical way, the persuasion of wary citizens to take um, what has been an incredibly speedy process um, to trust in that process, those are not trivial questions. And we have today a, vac um, a panel to discuss um, these really important questions. So um, I'm going to introduce the panelists as I actually um, ask them a question. And we're going to start um, first with John, John Arna Rottingen, who is the chief executive of the Research Council for Norway. And he's going to um, kick us off with an understanding of where we are currently in the process of vaccine development. So over to you, John Arna. Thank you so much, Maya. And, and it's great to be a part of this panel with the other colleagues here. Um, as you said, we the world is really eagerly waiting for a safe and effective vaccine, uh, uh, since we know that either vaccine-induced immunity or some level of natural immunity is the only way out uh, of the pandemic situation. And as you alluded to, we have had heard some very promising signals over the last couple of weeks. Both the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, and the Moderna COVID-19 vaccines have been reported to have around 95% efficacy. And those are fantastic news. Four months ago, actually, the Blavatnik School organized another panel on the COVID-19 vaccine situation. Then it was still very early, and, and now it feels a very long time ago. Uh, but actually, it's a short time, because the average time to develop a vaccine is around seven to eight years, if we look back in history. Vaccine development needs to go through many phases. You need to first to understand the biology of the new virus and the host response. We need to develop uh, vaccine candidates in the labs. Then we test those candidates in preclinical testing, uh, in animal models before we gradually start uh, often the many year long process of clinical testing in human uh, uh, subjects. And then finally, we have an approved vaccine. But we didn't have a 
that time now during in the midst of a pandemic. So we have seen an unprecedented, what I would call both a collaborative, but also a competitive set of activities over the last 10 months. Uh, it's a competition definitely against the clock, but of course also against uh, the other candidates. And we are now on track to have vaccines approved in under one year since the viral genome uh, was released on January the 12th in 2020. And I think these are unprecedented efforts, as I said. Uh, and I would say that the speed of action has been partly facilitated because we, uh, by, by organizations like CEPI, uh, an international organization for vaccine development that was established for preparing the world for epidemic uh, situations uh, and, and a collective vaccine development efforts. And CEPI managed to start investments in COVID-19 candidates in just a couple of weeks after these, uh, the viral sequence was, uh, was published. And now we have a situation where not only the CEPI uh, invested vaccines, but a large portfolio of vaccines are under development. The World Health Organization report that more than 200 vaccines are currently registered uh, and almost 50 of them are already in clinical trials, actually in less than, than 10 months. Um, and these vaccine candidates, they cut across all kinds of different so-called vaccine technologies or vaccine technology platforms. They are the old uh, traditional inactivated virus vaccines that we still use in many of our childhood vaccines. They are recombinant viral vaccines. They are protein subunit vaccines, as well as DNA and mRNA vaccines. And among these 50 candidates that are in clinical development, 11 of them are already in the last phase of clinical testing in the phase three trial. And that's where we test whether the vaccines are effective. And as I just mentioned, two of the trials, uh, both on mRNA vaccines, have just been issuing press releases. Um, we have heard from the Pfizer-BioNTech trial that now with their second press release reported that they have seen 170 events in the trial. And of those 170, 162 are in the control group and only eight among those vaccinated. If the vaccine had no effect, there would be a 50-50 split. But with this difference, it means almost around 95% effectiveness. And similar signals have come from the Moderna uh, vaccine. Um, however, two new vaccines that may be approved actually then before the end of the year, it's not sufficient to have them because the world needs billions of vaccine doses and manufacturing of complex biological products is difficult it needs know-how and technical infrastructures, and it takes time. Normally, it would have taken at least a year to produce the first lot and then starting from scratch, and six to nine months if facilities are already established. It takes time to scale up production. So this is why several countries and groups of countries have started already before the summer to procure at risk, without knowing whether the vaccines will work, millions of doses of vaccines. And this is a new situation and something we have not seen before. So there will be several hundred million vaccine doses available, more or less around the time when the vaccines will be approved. It's also a special situation and we haven't seen it before. But the challenge is that only some countries have been able to enter into those countries. Um, it means that we are in a much better place than if we had waited, but still we will have an in, unequal access to start with, um, because it's, this situation may challenge the goal of equitable, equitable global access since those who were in the position to make such investments are larger high income countries and it leaves smaller countries and lower middle income countries in an uncertain position. And that is why uh, the so-called access to COVID-19 tools accelerator was established in April to ensure the development and distribution of tests, vaccines and drugs for all. And the COVAX partnership is the vaccine pillar of this ACT accelerator. It has taken longer time than we had hoped for to establish the COVAX facility, but now 95 self-financing countries and 92 countries that will get support for vaccines are partners. And the COVAX facility is now entering into agreements with many of the vaccine producers uh, so that they will also be get, uh, the, have the ability to get vaccines early. The challenge remains though, we will not be able to deliver vaccines to all 
in 2021. So to sum up, we have never done better as a global community. New vaccines will be approved soon and scale up of production has started already some time ago. But there are many challenges and dilemmas that need to be addressed urgently. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, John Arna. So you've mentioned questions of manufacturing, technical capacity, especially in countries that, um, that don't have um, as much capacity to deliver the vaccine. Um, and on all of these questions, um, many eyes in the world are looking to India. India is the world's vaccine um, uh, factory. It manufactures uh, about 60% of the world's vaccines. And so um, it's a really important strategic case. Of course, it's also one of the countries that has the highest um, number of cases. So both from the question of production and the question of delivery, it's a, it's a really important uh, country to understand. So next I'll turn to Srinath Reddy, who's the president of the Public Health Foundation of India. Um, Srinath, can you tell us a little bit about what, uh, from a delivery perspective, the logistical hurdles will be in moving from factory to farm? So what are really the major challenges, the most important challenges of vaccine delivery in India? Well, I think as you rightly pointed out, production can be at a very high level. But depending upon the nature of vaccine that will be produced or procured from the international market, the challenges will begin firstly with the cold chain. I do not think the vaccines which are basically using the mRNA platform, are principally looking at uh, the Pfizer vaccine, for example, with minus 70 degrees requirement of the cold chain storage, or even to some extent the Moderna with the minus 20 degrees centigrade requirement. And that's going to be really the kind of vaccine that we would possibly be using. Though we do have the capacity for the minus 20, but nevertheless, vaccines which are unlikely to be so dependent upon a very uh, severe sub-zero temperature storage and transport requirement. Uh, those are not the kind of ones that we are likely to be picking up. That actually also takes us to the question as to whether the vaccine is going to be produced from an Indian manufacturer based on vaccines developed in India, or they're going to be produced by an Indian manufacturer on the basis of a license given by an international developer who then pro provides India license because of the huge uh, production base that we have. And both of these will determine what the nature of supply is going to be in terms of quantity and how much is going to be immediately available and how much is going to be available in later stages. We believe that as our health minister has announced that about 30 million people would be, uh, I mean, uh, 300 million people would be immunized by about September next year, with the anticipation that immunization programs would begin by February or March. Uh, the supply chain, of course, as I said, is partly dependent upon the production volume or the procurement volume, and also on the basis of the cold chain requirements. As of now, the cold chain requirements are being ramped up in terms of the facilities. Uh, already, the universal immunization program had Establish a countrywide cold chain uh, network, uh, but that is being ramped up further in order to ensure that the vaccines can be safely delivered. But the big challenge is going to be in terms of the health workforce. Unlike most of the immunization that has been delivered, either to much lower numbers or even in terms of the modality of delivery, which is, for example, oral polio vaccine. Uh, and this year we are going to be requiring an intramuscular injection. And if it's going to be a vaccine that requires two doses rather than one, then that's going to actually double the number, not only of the doses, but of the effort that goes into immunizing each individual person. So all of these will get into the logistics and therefore having the trained health workforce is going to be a very important element 
who as to who can actually provide the uh, vaccine shot. Uh, how do we identify? Then the staging of the people who are going to be getting the immunization, that is going to be dependent upon whether it's going to be on the essentiality criteria of essential health workers and other health other services, or it's going to be on the demographic and disease criteria based on people who are elderly and comorbidities, or is it going to be a mix of both the criteria? I suspect it's going to be a mix of both the criteria, but that is also going to determine the initial numbers as to also the ease with which such people can be identified and uh, assembled for immunization. Uh, assembling the essential health workers and other uh, essential services is not going to be difficult. But identifying people with comorbidities is going to be rather difficult because many of the people may not be aware, especially in rural areas, of their hypertension, diabetes, or other comorbidity status because of relatively ineffective screening programs of the past. Therefore, age criterion may have to be applied as one way of uh, identifying people with uh, identified or even unidentified comorbid comorbidities because on the assumption that people about the age of 60 are more likely to have comorbidities. But how do we assemble them in different places? How do we actually administer the immunization in two doses? How do we follow them up for potential adverse effect, minor or major? These are going to be some of the challenges. But uh, I think it's also going to depend upon the demand. Right now, there is no vaccine hesitancy in India uh, in any manner. But nevertheless, if the immunization process starts abroad in other countries, then the Indian people and the Indian media would be carefully watching what the experience of the vaccine is going to be outside and then they will decide uh, how much they will volunteer to be immunized. And that, again, will reset the demand and the supply chain dynamics. But I believe that if we get a vaccine which doesn't require very severe sub-zero temperatures, we are in a position to deliver the vaccine, uh, both through our production and procurement capacity, as well as the distribution chain of network, uh, the real challenge would be to find the people who can actually deliver the injection. And right now we are looking at not only doctors and nurses from different areas, but also looking at medical students and nursing students and other vaccinators who can be trained uh, for this particular purpose. And therefore, uh, swelling up the numbers of people who can actually administer the vaccine uh, is a challenge that is being addressed at the moment. Thank you, Serena. So let me pick up on a point that you ended on, um, which is the question of how one monitors um, for potential adverse consequences, long-term consequences um, of, of the uh, vaccination. So I'm going to turn to um, Gifty Emmanuel, who's an infectious disease specialist and a virologist. He just said to me, he's always on the hunt for the next, um, the next COVID. Um, and um, so from, the, from a medical perspective, how do we um, think about managing any adverse reactions that arise? Um, and how do we catch any long-term effects of the disease? Uh, thank you, Maya. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Yes, uh, I'm very interested in the next emerging uh, outbreak or emerging infection, especially emerging viruses. Uh, to begin with, uh, we have come a long way uh, with this pandemic. We have made a great stride of creating some five to 10 candidate vaccines of which at least four of them will totally succeed. Uh, but the point is uh, with progress comes certain pitfalls and which needs to be addressed. To begin with is the adverse reaction. Every vaccine in this world has an adverse reaction. The simple logic is when you inject a protein, it is a xenoprotein, it creates immunogenicity or it, it creates immune response. At the same time, it can also create um, any adverse effect because it is alien to the human system. So in, in that context, post-vaccination fever, myalgias, arthralgia, a life-threatening anaphylactic shock, and death can also happen. Fatalities are reported, but not very high though but definitely it can lead to a lot of negative press. 
to begin with, when you launch a vaccination of this magnitude uh, at the population level, nearly covering billions of people at a time, because it's a pandemic, we need to have something called pharmacovigilance and vaccines adverse reaction reporting. This can be online, this can be offline, it can be done in any manner. This will help us to somehow track the vaccination system itself. And we can always address adverse reactions at they arise. Uh, to begin with, all the trials so far done, the class one, class two, and class three, and the extended and fast-track trials which have been done are in a limited population, except for one or two vaccines. Uh, so obviously, uh, we do not know what are the long-term adverse reactions. Some are theoretical, some could be very real. So the medical management of these adverse reactions are very important before we even go into uh, launching the vaccine. And there are a few other things which I would like to highlight. Uh, one is the correlates of protection. Any vaccine has to create a correlate of protection in the sense, in the simplest term, it means the quantum of antibodies formed and the length and duration of protection afforded. For instance, um, all these vaccines uh, claim around 90, 95, and 92, and percentage all about 90, which is very, very encouraging. In fact, uh, conventional vaccines like hepatitis B vaccine hasn't been able to cross 80%. We have had four generations of hepatitis B vaccine and Maxio after Blumberg discovered hepatitis B and its vaccine. We've had a huge vaccination history and still we are not able to cross 80 to 90%. And similarly with other vaccines in viral field, we, we are not able to cross even 60 influenza vaccines for that matter, pandemic influences. So the point here is, will we be really able to uh, reach this particular quantum of immune response in a sustained manner. It's quite likely six months down the line, uh, the vaccine levels could drop to 50. We need a plateau, not a staircase downwards. So this kind of spiraling down can happen with uh, vaccination, which initially show very high levels of response and they are not sustained. That's why we're using a prime and boost system uh, in the sense that we give a vaccine on day zero and then we, after 30 days, we give the next dose. Uh, so it's a double vaccination system. And, and that is because we need a lot of boosting. So the next vaccination requirement couldn't come within the next eight months or one year. So it is an annual vaccination scheme. Then again, we are not sure if it's gonna be double dose again or a single dose. Uh, we've had a lot of experience with influenza vaccines and um, annual vaccination with influenza has not been uh, very consistent in certain subsets of the population. They get vaccinated and then the next year they don't. So these are issues which can crop up in the years to come. Then the next point, which I uh, hate to dampen the enthusiasm, but uh, if you look at Darwinian evolution principles, it applies even to viruses. Uh, viruses, the moment you put them under selection pressure of a vaccine, it is bound to become resistant. I hate to say this, but this is reality because uh, the viruses right now, it's having a field day. Uh, it's a naive human immune system and they are literally feeding on us. But the day you put uh, effective antiviral vaccine into the system, into the ecology, the host and the virus ecology, uh, what ha really happens is the virus will fight back. And there is a huge probability we might have vaccine escape mutants, which, which happened in hepatitis B and uh, other viral diseases. So that's a huge area which we need to uh, look into it. And the other logistic problem which we can face in populous countries like India and China, which was very much affected, is the needle-based uh, intramuscular vaccination. So when you're using a needle-based intramuscular vaccination, the biggest problem is not the vaccination by itself, but the way in which it is delivered. The infection control is a huge uh, issue. Uh, let us say a tertiary uh, center in a tropical country like India or a certain parts of Asia, uh, there's a likelihood of this vaccine being multiple dose, the same vaccine being given to multiple people, even if it is in a preloaded syringe. There is also questions of infection control. We have huge levels of blood-borne pathogens identified and non-identified like hepatitis C. 
So transmission of these pathogens can happen, and it has happened in the past uh, with the vaccination for other diseases. You could contract some other, you could be protected against corona, uh, but you could contract hepatitis C, which is equally or even probably more bad than this. And, and the third thing, which I would like to emphasize on this particular vaccination delivery is we can use something like a vaccination jet or transdermal vaccination. Probably in the future, we might come with such formulations or even na nasal vaccines, which can trigger mucosal immune response and they can be free of any inadvertent transmission of uh, viruses. Uh, the next very important issue, which we cannot afford to overlook, is this is a zoonotic disease. We know this came from animals. Uh, it is recombined within animals before it hit the human immune system. And uh, recently, we had something called as uh, mink infections uh, with the SARS-CoV-2. And, and after passage through the mink, which is a furry animal found in um, the northern hemispheres, and this particular furry animal made it much more virulent. Usually after a passage through animals, viruses can become attenuated and less virulent. But in this case, we know in Finland, it's become very virulent, and they've asked for the culling of so many millions of uh, um, minks there. So that shows such a comeback could threaten your vaccine strain. Such a comeback could uh, completely destroy what we are planning to attain in a very heroic manner within such a short span of time, the whole globe in a concerted manner, which, uh, which is happening right now. Uh, it's really heartwarming, but these kind of zoonotic possibilities uh, threaten our very own effective vaccine strategies. Uh, the next uh, issue is uh, something called as antibody or ADE, antibody dependent enhancement. Uh, we've been treating a lot of cases of dengue and chikungunya and similar related viral diseases. Uh, if there is a prior antibody or if you immunize someone against a disease, sometimes because of admixing of the immune system and the viral components of related viruses, you can have uh, some kind of enhancement. So the next time it can become very severe. If you are uh, infected one, one strain of dengue virus, the next time you contract dengue, it's going to be very severe. So there are theoretical risks that this vaccine can create such a milieu. And when you have an actual infection, again, uh, there could be an activated, hyperactivated immune system with cytokinemia, huge possibility of uh, lung disorders like adverse uh, reactions like adult respiratory distress and fatalities could be high. This is a theoretical risk, uh, yeah. but, but we still need to address that. Yeah. So these are the things which, which I think um, needs to be uh, considered while thinking of vaccination, apart from uh, the basic vaccine monitoring and addressing the medical aspects related to the vaccine. Great, thank you, Gifty, for um, sounding, I think, an important sobering note about, about um, the possibilities of, of um, mutation and um, the challenges that, that lie ahead um, medically. But I wanna now take a step back and turn to uh, my wonderful colleague, Joe Wolf, who's the Alfred Landecker Professor of Values and Public Policy, um, who I know has been thinking um, with a number of others about how we think about prioritization of the vaccine. Um, we know that um, even at the, the incredibly rapid speed that we've been moving, there are simply not enough doses um, for everyone to get vaccinated first, which raises some thorny ethical issues. So Joe, how do we think about who gets vaccinated first? Well, thank you so much for involving me in this discussion. And um, I, I'll be, be very quick. The, there are two questions about distribution that are being discussed at the moment. Both of them have been touched on. One of them is about distribution within a country. So, so once the country has a supply of the vaccine, who gets it within that country? But there's a prior question of how does it get distributed to a country in the first place so that the, uh, the companies will produce and manufacture the vaccine? Where does it go first? And a lot of people have been discussing this question. And in the published and unpublished contributions I've seen, I, I think I can detect five different approaches that people have taken. And so what I'm going to do just very quickly is go through these five approaches to set the scene. So one of them is just a free market and that we allow the pharmaceutical companies just to sell the vaccine 
to the highest bidder. Um, and you know, that, that is what we would normally do with, with pharmaceuticals on a global scale. Um, and some have argued that we should just carry on and do the same thing. Uh, the second, subtly different, is known as vaccine nationalism. And, and that is a country's putting their own country first. So how does that differ from free markets? Well, imagine you are a citizen of the United States and an American company has just produced the first vaccine. And they tell you they're going to sell it to Japan and Germany because uh, they're prepared to pay more. Quite likely, uh, the citizens will be in uproar and say that there shouldn't be an export license, that it should go to Americans first. So vaccine nationalism, although sometimes people confuse it with the free market solution, it's different. The vaccine nationalism says we in our country should keep it. We should immunize ourselves before we allow it outside the country. Now, a, a third approach is, tries to bring in issues of equity. And we see this through the COVAX partnership that has already been mentioned and the WHO have already put out an idea and the WHO have said we have to oppose the free market and vaccine nationalism and what we need to do initially is to distribute the vaccine around the world and to members of COVAX which were or recipients of COVAX which include the low and middle income countries should all receive a proportional amount. And they say at the moment, initially 3% and then up to 20% of the population. So the idea is every country should get an amount of vaccine equivalent to 20% of the population in a, a type of fair proportional model. But I've been associated with another group that um, we published our paper in Science last month and we argued that the instead of having a proportional international distribution, there should be an international distribution that we called the fair priority model, which says that the vaccine should go to those countries that need it most. So the countries that have a massive outbreak should receive it. Uh, we talk about life years rather than lives. So countries like India, I believe, where the as statistics are showing that younger people are dying than in other countries, that, that India would have high priority, if that is true, when, when we look at the statistics. But there is a whole range of things we could do, but, but these are equity-based models that say we need to respond on the basis of need, first of all, rather than proportionally. And finally, some people are talking about open licensing, which says just get rid of patents, let anyone around the world produce it a lot we here would be produced in India, perhaps also in Brazil. Um, but on, on this idea, there are no patents anymore. Everyone can produce it as a generic. So these are five different models, the free market, vaccine nationalism, the proportional model, the fair priority model, and open licensing. And I think what we're going to see is a combination of all of these. But from the equity point of view, what we need to do is keep talking about fair priority, keep talking about proportion, keep talking about open licensing, get as much of that in the mix as we can, and as little free markets and vaccine nationalism. But we're never going to overcome vaccine nationalism. No country that has produced the vaccine will let it all go, but uh, uh, we can at least modify it in some other directions. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Joe, for that really um clear distillation of, of the various models. I'm next going to turn to um, Suri Moon, who's the co-director of the Global Health Center at the Graduate Institute of Geneva. And I know that Suri has been um, actually very closely following um, what countries have been doing on the multilateral front um, and who has been buying what. So Suri, can you tell us a little bit about what commitments have already been made um, uh, by countries to buy vaccines um, and what is the outlook for further multilateral cooperation on that front? Thanks very much for the question and also for the opportunity to be here. I think this is a really fascinating uh, and important discussion to be having um, to be having now. Before I turn to the question of um, multilateral cooperation, what I wanted to first uh, clarify is that 
um, in the same way that we have raced in an unprecedented way to develop the vaccines, we are racing in an unprecedented way to uh, build the structures for multilateral cooperation for vaccine distribution. Uh, so COVAX has been built uh, almost overnight. And this is because we actually didn't have any agreements prior to the COVID uh, outbreak for how we would in fact pay for and distribute something, uh, a scarce resource like a, like a vaccine in the event of a global pandemic. This is a real problem that has to be addressed, certainly in any reform of international rules that, that comes after. But we're, we're left scrambling because we didn't actually prepare for this um, adequately in advance. I do think that the creation of COVAX, ha COVAX has been a very important uh, development, and, and I sometimes call it a ray of sunshine in a pretty dark situation. Uh, and we've had 100 and, over 180 countries now committing to it, covering about 90% or more of the world's population, $2 billion now um, uh, allocated uh, to subsidize some of the payments for the vaccines, especially for the poorest uh, countries. And I think a really smart design that tries to provide incentives for all countries, including the richer countries uh, that may have an incentive, in fact, to engage in nationalism, as uh, Joe Wolf has said, um, you know, a, a smart design to try to incentivize countries, in fact, to cooperate more with each other. Um, I think the big challenge is that despite all of these efforts, what we're seeing happening is um, uh, more complex and perhaps a little bit less encouraging than, than the design of the, the COVAX facility might um, might lead us to hope. And what we have been seeing is that many countries, uh, including the rich countries, but actually many middle income countries also are doing what is rational uh, and what makes sense politically for any country to do, which is to say, I'm going to first defend the needs of my own citizens. So you have countries who are uh, in fact hoarding as much, buying up as much supply as they can and using their economic resources, their political uh, and diplomatic relationships, their industrial capacity to manufacture factor all to try to get access to some vaccines. And, and also I should add uh, participating in clinical trials for those countries that may not have um, so much money to put on the table. They say our citizens will actually participate in the clinical trials. And so what emerges is actually a pretty complex picture in which uh, governments are hedging their bets. They're saying we will secure bilaterally. We will also put some money into COVAX. Uh, we'll also make deals with lots of different, uh, different companies. And it's a very, very complex picture. But once you put all the pieces together, what you you see is that the, the slice of the pie that is left for multilateral cooperation, that is left for an initiative like COVAX, gets smaller and smaller. So every time any country is successful in securing through a bilateral deal with a company some volume of vaccine, the amount of pie that is left for a more rational and ethical um, and public health oriented distribution system through COVAX gets smaller. And, and this is one of the big problems that we're seeing, uh, what we're seeing today. I would say one of the aspects of the, the uh, vaccine access issue that has not gotten enough tension, attention in the media or even among experts, is the question of vaccines coming from China and, and Russia. And so out of the 11 candidates that Yanarne mentioned that are in phase three trials, we have four being developed by uh, Chinese uh, organizations or companies and one uh, by, uh, by the Russian uh, Gamaleya Institute. And what we see is that vaccines are not just a public health tool, they're very, they are very much a strategic asset. That of course, governments see getting vaccines as a strategic asset, but also being able to give vaccines as a strategic Acid, a way to shore up your political relationships, your alliances um, with other countries. And we see a lot of uh, low and middle income countries accessing Western, Russian, and Chinese uh, vaccines. It's been much harder to get information, however, on what exactly the volume is. Uh, we have much better information, I would say, in the public domain about who is securing um, the, the vaccines being developed primarily by the Western um, uh, by the Western, by the Western firms, I think one of the key linchpins in terms of how widespread uh, access to uh, the Chinese or Russian vaccines will be is actually WHO. That WHO's uh, regulatory um, uh, approval or WHO basically giving the green light, giving a recommendation for any of these vaccines is going to be very important to provide confidence around the world that uh, the data is there to really um, provide uh, you know confidence in in the safety. And 
and efficacy. So again, WHO is going to be very much in the limelight. Um, I'd like to just wrap up by saying, you know, we are in this situation because we didn't prepare properly. And we've heard this message over and over again, um, but we didn't prepare properly to make sure that we would have systems in place for globally equitable access to any kind of health technology needed in a pandemic, not just vaccines, but diagnostics, uh, drugs or therapeutics as well. And one thing that's really essential in the future is that we fix this problem, that we agree on rules and put money on the table so that when the next pandemic hits, we're not scrambling in the same way that we are today. Thank you so much, um, uh, Suri. I, that was um, a really, I think, helpful look into um, what we need to be doing for the next um, pandemic. Um, finally, let me turn to Toby Simon, who's the founder and director of the Syner Synergia Foundation with which we are co-hosting this event. Um, and Tabi, can I ask you to talk a little bit about um, the manufacturing capacity um, that India um, has and, and any potential roadblocks you see ahead? Um, how will India as the world's manu vaccine manufacturer cope with the incredible demands that will be placed on it um, in the near future? Thank you so much, Maya. And I want to thank uh, uh, John Arne also for helping organize this wonderful uh, round table. We call it a round table. Uh, I'll just step back and say that there are going to be a few challenges which uh, all, all countries, all manufacturing countries will have to face, including India. And the first is what uh, Suri alluded to, the securitization of global health making it as much as a national security and international, an issue of international diplomacy as much as health. We are so mindful of this because we live now in a more polarized world where decisions are not taken uh, in, in an equitable fashion. The second is the trade-off between uh, the vaccines that the host country, the manufacturing country needs and what are the needs of the global organizations. So that's again going to be a very contested issue, uh, both at home and, and uh, you know, internationally. For example, in India, the challenge is we will have to immunize 1.3 billion people. And if you're talking about two doses, it's about 2.6 billion you know, units. Uh, the third and the one that uh, I have some expertise on is, in, is to ensure the pedigree and the security of the supply chain. I was involved with uh, Medicine Sans Frontier and the WHO in validating uh, three Indian companies way back in mid-90s uh, for the antiretroviral drugs. It took us five years uh, to get these companies validated, and these were big companies. Okay? Now, here you're going to go in for a rush, and you are asking uh, many companies to come in and manufacture without much validation. So I think this is something that we got to be careful and I'm sure Suri and uh, all would have a perspective on it because without regulations, you do not know. And you have had several issues in the past where vaccines went wrong and, and the consequences are, are huge, both politically and in health. And finally, I would like to say the geopolitics of vaccine and the geopolitics of vaccine is it's like the nuclear bomb, the atomic bomb. Okay? And it's going to be a game changer for reasons which most speakers have now alluded to, and this is irreversible. Now about India, I just would like to say that, you know, there are a few companies and I will name them. Uh, we have, the first one is Serum, which most people know. Uh, they, they have the capacity to produce the largest number of uh, vaccines, about 1.5 billion is what is being estimated. They have a partnership now with AstraZeneca and the Oxford University. Uh, and the, the clinical trials have started. We hope something happens there. Second is a company by name Zydus. They are producing their own vaccine called Psycovi, an Indian vaccine. The third is a company called Panacea Biotech. They are having a partnership with a US-based company called Rafana, based in Ireland. There is a fourth one called Indian Immunologicals, which is based in India, but having a partnership with an Australian the Griffith University in Australia. A company fifth is Biological Events in Hyderabad. They have a partnership going with Johnson & Johnson. And finally, you have uh, 
uh, uh, Dr. Reddy's uh, having the partnership with the Russian manufacturer, the, with Sputnik. So uh, as uh, earlier speakers have alluded to, they also the, the other challenge is going to be that uh, 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 about 40 to 50% of the companies that have gone into clinical trials are also companies based in China and uh, outside. So the question is, uh, you know, how do you ensure that uh, human dignity, human, uh, you know, values transcend geopolitics? I think the biggest challenge in manufacturing is going to be managing this. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Toby. Um... I'm going to take uh, the first question to um, Joe Wolf, um, and that question is from Lawrence. And the question is, in the model which allocates vaccine on a national basis, are there, should there be controls over how the recipient nation chooses to vaccinate domestically? Um, and in particular, Lawrence is concerned of that lower caste and class and minority populations are going to be disproportionately excluded. Yeah, so that's that's a great question. So on uh, the models, for example, that I was part developing, uh, a country will be allocated first because of the severe outbreaks in their country. And if we then find the vaccine goes to the president, the president's family, the senior business people, and so on. Obviously, that would violate the terms of the uh, of, of the, the grant. So somehow that would need to be regulated to some degree. Um, it would be very hard to say to a country, "No, you can't have the vaccine because we don't think you're going to use it the way we want you to use it." So that would be, you know, you know, quite a patronizing thing to try to police countries one by one in that way. But I, I think this this is a real concern that um, what we've seen is that um, it takes a lot of time and effort to counter any form of injustice. And the pandemic has made us relax those efforts to some degree or even reverse them because we've got everyone for, for themselves really in case of emergency. And so we've seen all fractures uh, within society growing and it may well be that this will happen with, with vaccine distribution as well. So there are many, many uh, aspects to this, we, you know, we can talk at a high level, but the details really do matter. Yes, I agree. Great. Um, sorry, I'm going to turn to you next. Um, and there's a question about um, the uh, Trump administration deciding to uh, stop funding the WHO. And you touched on um, questions of preparation, uh, preparing for um, the next pandemic. Um, so what impact will that decision have um, does it have an impact on the legitimacy and acceptability of the vaccine um, and future vaccines produced and approved by or uh, approved by the World Health Organization? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. Um, and I think it's also useful to remind people that the Trump administration made it very clear it was not willing to participate uh, in COVAX. And it's very unfortunate because the US remains really a superpower in terms of vaccine research and development and production. The US controls quite a large volume of vaccines, um, not all of which it probably will end up being able to, or needing to use or being able to use. And so I think one of the first things um, that is important to recognize about where the Trump administration uh, has, has been on this issue is that they, they've taken a very US first um, approach, uh, but have made you know, no arrangements for sharing supply with the rest of the world. And, and I do hope this will change uh, with the new administration com coming in. Um, but in terms of WHO specifically, I mean, I, I don't think that the potential, uh, I mean, the Biden uh, president-elect has said, has said he will uh, reverse that decision to leave WHO on his first day in office. So we don't expect a big budget hit. Um, and I do think that WHO's role as an independent um, judge of the safety and efficacy of this whole suite of vaccines is more important than ever. And that many, many countries and individuals will be looking to um, WHO's judgment on this, but because it will be 
so heavily scrutinized. I think it's going to have to be extremely careful about how it explains, you know, what kind of data did we get? Why do we have this or that level of confidence in this or that um, candidate? But I mean, this is really the, the hot seat that WHO is very, very often in is trying to balance a very um, broad range of political um, pressures and demands and to try to offer the best advice based on science and evidence. I hope that they'll be able to do that. And I hope that people will take that guidance um, uh, uh, seriously. But of course, there's going to be a, a whole range of views on, on attitudes for WHO around the world. Thank you. Um, Srinath, I'm going to turn to you next um, with a question from Natalie, and that is about whether people who have already contracted COVID-19, um, will vaccination be needed for them or will it be helpful in any way in conferring further immunity? Well, uh, people who have contracted COVID-19 earlier fall into three categories. Those who have been hospitalized, those who might not have been hospitalized with mild infections, and those that were detected purely on antibody-based serological surveys to have been infected. Some of them could be false positive. Some of them, many of them could be actually people who are infected and remained asymptomatic. In none of them are we sure about the duration of immunity based only on the antibody levels. Because very often we don't have the cellular immunity measured in these people. It is possible as based on research studies that cellular immunity may last longer than three months, may last for six months as per recent studies, or even may last longer. So we are not sure how protected these individuals are from reinfection. And we are already seeing some reported instances of reinfection based on genetic signatures of the second virus being different from that of the first virus. So we have to proceed on the assumption that there is still vulnerability. Secondly, even if antibodies were produced and some cell immune, cell mediated immunity was actually stimulated, it might not have been strong enough to last a long time. It depends upon the viral load they were exposed to and what the body's own capacity to produce lasting immunity is. So given all of that, and also the nature of the previous coronaviruses, where the SARS-1 virus actually had immunity lasting up to two to three years, but the common cold coronaviruses have immunity lasting only for a few months. So I think people who have been infected earlier, and particularly who did not provide a strong antibody response to lasting beyond a few weeks, they would indeed be candidates for revaccination. Thank you. So the next question, I'm gonna to, uh, turn to John Arna Rottingen. Um, this is uh, from Vitus, um, who is the London correspondent of Televisa TV. And he asks, out of the um, 11 advanced candidate uh, the vaccine candidates, which ones will need the least sub-zero environment? Um, and that's related to questions, of course, of, of distribution and low capacity um, context, which other, other uh, questions have come in on. So it, um, it's, it's a variation and it depends on the, uh, in, in different time periods because uh, we know that the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine we would need ultra cold chains, so down to minus 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, but the Moderna MR, mRNA vaccine that is formulated a bit differently, uh, still need freezer, but just minus 20 and can sort of be still sufficiently active after almost a month in a fridge temperature. Uh, so actually many of the other vaccines, um, uh, and, and, and those are both sort of traditional uh, attenuated or inactivated spiral vaccines, uh, including three of the Chinese vaccines that Suri Moon mentioned, as well as some of the recombinant viral vaccines, they will be able to, to not be stored, but at least be, uh, be in uh, sort of intermediary storage before vaccination for several weeks uh, in pitch temperatures. Um, so, so it would be much easier than in most contexts to use those vaccines. Okay, um, so there's a question um, which I'm going to actually throw out um, for everyone, um, and you know, feel free to to jump in if this is if you have a, a, a helpful answer to this, 
which is um, what do you say to individuals who have expressed concern about the safety of the vaccines, given how very quickly they are being produced at a speed we've never seen before? How do we reassure people that the vaccines have passed standard safety protocols? So who would like to answer that? I see a finger from John Arna. Take it away. I, I think yeah, I can start and I think Gifty already alluded to some of this. Um, I think we should appreciate that this, this is definitely going faster than most vaccine development, but still the, the, we are saving that time mostly because we are doing things in parallel and we are avoiding a lot of the delays that are normally happening. So we're just putting a lot of more resources, both on the authority side, on the research side and on the company's side. Um, the large vaccine trials now being conducted with uh, yeah, between 30 to 50,000 individuals in each of the trials, they will definitely be able to pick up uh, concerns on side effects um, uh, in those large groups. Uh, I guess the, um, and, we, and we know that most side effects will uh, occur in the first couple of months after vaccination. Uh, and now at least tens of thousands of volunteers have been followed for more than two months. But still more rare side effects will still be potentially occur. Uh, and we saw that with the swine flu um, pandemic um, uh, vaccine. Uh, and uh, the only way to actually pick up those very rare side effects are through very solid monitoring of vaccines after they have been approved. Uh, that we both do solid research studies as well as following uh, through pharmacovigilance systems uh, potential uh, individual incidents. Um, and, and, and of course, we need to do that in, in this situation. My sense is it is not important for everyone to rush for a vaccine. It depends on what is your priority. Uh, if you see, look at it historically, most uh, pandemics have vanished over a period of time. You know, two years, three years, it has just gone away. So if you, if your work, your life doesn't necessitate that you are traveling much, I think you can also take a safer bet of, you know, like how they try to control Ebola by staying home, uh, that you might be able to take a second path and there was no need to rush and perhaps even wait to see how the first uh, sets of vaccines uh, that people are taking. It's a trade-off, you know, because you need to move fast. You need to restart something fast. You take it. So I think there could be more than one approach that, uh, as an individual, we could take. Great. I'm, I'm going to have a couple more questions here that I think we can get to because I know we're running out of time. So very quickly, um, um, Charlie from um, Al Jazeera is asking um, the, about the UK government and its amended law to allow COVID vaccine to be distributed unlicensed and about whether other countries are doing this. Um, maybe Suri, do you have anything to say on that? Um, I, I I don't have insight on the, the UK situation, but we... we um, do know that uh, a number of vaccines have been authorized for use under emergency use provision. So they've not been fully um, uh, licensed or approved. Of course, the trials are not yet done and that, that holds across the board, um, but that the, the Russian, uh, the Gamalay Institute vaccine and some of the Chinese vaccines have already been used both within uh, the home countries and also further afield in, in the UAE, for example. Uh, I think uh, there are there is a real need to monitor very closely and to the maximum extent possible, you know, what, what is happening. But I do think that it's very clear you need to have full data, you need to have full regulatory review. Um, and some have even argued you need to continue um, monitoring uh, and, and keeping, in fact, a control group for at least two years to try to detect any safety signals with any of the vaccines. So I think there's a lot of uh, further work to be done. Thank you. And I'm going to end with one last question, I believe from a former um, one of our students, M Emily uh, Cameron Blake. And she asks, as vaccines are developed and approved, 
do you think there's going to become a ranking system uh, for vaccines in terms of percentage of immunity um, provided, ease of distribution, um, single dose or multiple dose? Um, who would do such a ranking and how might this uh, affect supply chains? Um, so I'll just end on that question. Um, uh, let's see, who, who wants to take that? Um, John Arna, do you want to have the last word? Uh, yeah, quickly. Yes, it will. But, but the point is there is no one ranking system because the contexts are different and the use uh, cases are different. Uh, and I think what we need to be very transparent on is that vaccines have different profiles and they may be beneficial in different contexts for different groups. Um, for instance, we have not mentioned the fact that some vaccines may first and foremost protect against disease, a serious disease, but not protect against transmission. And then it's really in, in accordance with what Toby said, it's, it's really those who have the highest disease risk uh, that should be prioritized uh, because it will not be uh, influ that influential when it comes to trying to stop transmission. Uh, and then of course we have the fact that some vaccines may work better in, in the elderly and, and then we definitely should prioritize those vaccines for the elderly. So ranking is important, uh, including on price uh, and on cold chain requirements. And, and I think there will be not one, but many actors, then I think we need, as Suri mentioned, to, to trust the World Health Organization to providing robust and unbiased evidence uh, on all these factors. All right, well, we have um, ended um, our time, our allotted time, and um, so I will just um, thank on behalf of, um, I know, uh, a very big audience, um, uh, the panelists for lending their, co their collective expertise on this enormous, uh, enormously important issue um, and to help further public discussion on it. So thank you to all of you for joining us from wherever you are um, and uh, we'll see you, see you soon. <laughs>